Yes, thank you, Ashok. Uh, so to build on that and build on uh, Ashok's introduction, uh, it seemed like a useful compliment um, and leading into what Richard will share, um, to say a few words about economic levers in general and then give you an example from my own research uh, in um, Ghana and in uh, Mali earlier uh, that I think illustrates the kinds of power that economic levers have. So, you know, Archimedes said, you know, give me a long enough lever and a place to stand and I can move the world. Which begs the question of what's the place to stand? What's the fulcrum of this lever? And, you know, you chose to come to the economics lever session. There are inclusion levers, uh, governance levers, technology levers. What is it that economics levers are standing on? Um, and it seems useful to me to think about standing on the entrepreneurial spirit that sort of universal desire for a better life uh, for oneself, but often especially for one's children, you know, that every mother, father, uh, household shares and that people in markets and, uh, and farm uh, activities share. And we can ask as economists or as people interested in an economics approach, from their point of view, what are the constraints they face what are the resource limitations and access and prices? Uh, and that leads to the instruments that Ashok described, at least the instruments um, that Olivier mentioned. Um, but especially when you think about people interacting with each other, quite often one well-intentioned uh, entrepreneurial person meeting another uh, well-intentioned entrepreneurial person will find it very hard to shake hands and make a deal, either because there's some constraint in market structure, and we'll think about the institutions that will allow people to, uh, for example, you know, you drive on the left-hand side of the street, I'll drive on the right-hand side of the street. It's going to be different in India than in Europe, but um, as long as you stay on the right side and there's a traffic policeman at the intersection, traffic will move smoothly if you take away the rule, take away the traffic policeman. So this is the, vi you know, the traffic won't move. So this is the visible hand of the state that makes the private handshake possible. This is what we're thinking about as economists. So the example that I want to give that I think illustrates this long lever of economic, uh, the visible hand of government that makes markets possible, uh, concerns the problem of infant feeding. So I've done a lot of economics and uh, I have done a little bit of nutrition, and as a late convert to nutrition, I'm particularly fervent. Um, and I only got to take one class in nutrition uh, in graduate school, but I was very lucky to take it from Ray Martorell, uh, who's a very prominent nutrition professor in the United States. And um, ever since then, what struck me as one well, particularly important uh, issue is that after a period of exclusive breastfeeding, infant needs, after about six months of age, food that is of greater nutrient density and digestibility than the family diet. Much greater nutrient density and digestibility. And that there are fundamentally two ways to obtain that greater nutrient density and digestibility. So this is not food that's present anywhere else in the family diet. Once you're more than two years of age, you don't need this high density and digestibility. One, you can do it yourself using an ancestral recipe. So that is typically a starchy staple fortified by a source of protein and, uh, and fats and micronutrients that might be some legumes, some vegetable matter, some, some vegetables and some perhaps animal source foods, and a lot of processing. So what you see is fermentation, germination, grinding, roasting, processing of great intensity to produce a very small quantity of food for a six-month, eight-month, ten-month-year-old uh, infant. And that labor intensity is extremely costly. The alternative is you can buy the stuff. Where an artisanal or industrial producer will do all that labor intensive processing for you. And the problem there is you can't observe the nutrient density or digestibility that's in this complementary food. You cannot see it, you cannot taste it, you can't smell it. And when you feed it to the child, if it's not there, the child will fail to thrive, fall below their growth curve, below their growth potential. But lots of other things could have caused that because at that time, the introduction of complementary foods after six months is also the first time they're getting water. So they're exposed to waterborne parasitic and infectious disease. It's the first time they're getting out of the house and interacting with children, so they're exposed to upper respiratory uh, diseases. Parasitic loads rise, and you see lots of other potential causes of failure to thrive. So you cannot observe 
you the mother, no matter how much you're hoping for a better life for your child, can observe the nutrient density and digestibility. So what do we see in economics of this kind of situation? You see a entrepreneur arise and produce a very high value product, carefully made, nicely packaged, advertised, often uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of relationship over a long period of time. And because they're a monopolist, often to have that long-standing relationship, a very high price. And you're all familiar in markets like this of the, the Cadillac version, the fancy law firm, the prominent doctor in town, where you, you pay a premium, you know you're paying a lot, but you know it's going to be high quality. And in the infant foods market, you know what I'm talking about. It's Nestle's Cerelac. It's billboards that have been up since the 1960s. It's has nothing to do with Similac and, and uh, infant formula. We're talking about Cerelac, right? Rice or wheat or maize based with the complementary uh, nutrient fortification that I talked about as being necessary and the iconic packaging that everyone knows. And in a you know, somewhat well-to-do household, you'll see a nice row of these pots carefully planted with plants growing because the family is quite proud that they have a dozen cans of Cerelac that they've got with plants growing in the cans. So the problem is everybody knows you can make food of the same nutrient value, density and digestibility of Cerelac, for one-fifth or one-fourth the cost. And the reason why we know that is because donors have been doing it for 30 years. So ever since in Caparina in Central America and many other products around the world, donors have funded startups to take a local starchy staple, fortify it with local legumes and other products, and produce the same nutrient density and digestibility at a fourth or fifth the cost. We know this works well in institutional settings. And when those startup entrepreneurial firms go to sell this product in the marketplace, what we know is consumers don't buy it. They don't buy it, and the economics hypothesis is because they can't see the quality. And so the economic lever here is to overcome the constraint of information between the buyer and the seller. And in the research a decade ago in Mali, we were able to do a market experiment in which a certifier, so a standard economics lever, is, of course, the price taxes and the issues that Olivier talked about, the ones that Richard is about to talk about, um, but also the institutions of governance of the market the traffic policeman at the intersection who keeps the traffic flowing. And in this case, the quality certifier who stands between the seller and the buyer to say, you can't see what's in this uh, sachet of infant foods, but we have inspected the plant, tested samples, and we can certify this is of high quality. What we showed in the Mali work is that the willingness to pay of even illiterate mothers out of their desire for a better life, healthy for the children, and knowing that nutrient density and digestibility was an important issue, we're willing to pay quite a lot for that information. And then in this follow-up work in Ghana, we showed that because of the lack of information, the entrepreneurs who were successful in selling in an institutional setting to the donor were unable to sell to the private sector because of this lack of information, and that a quality certification service could stand on the fulcrum of the entrepreneurs wanting to sell and the householders wanting to buy, but not having access to the information about the intrinsic quality. And by signaling that quality through quality certification, make the traffic flow much faster and have entrepreneurs sell high quality, nutrient dense and digestible infant foods from local ingredients made in lots of different uh, ways, as we know from every culture represented in this room, people have different ways of feeding infants um, and, uh, and different price points, kinds of packaging. That's the market that those of us who had the luxury of growing up in an industrial society grew up with, where in the United States we have the Food and Drug Administration inspecting the plants of generic manufacturers of infant food, so we can buy the fancy Cerelac, but we can also buy the generic. That luxury is not available to people in almost all developing countries because they don't have that economic lever that makes the market, in this case, the lever of uh, quality certification. 
Um, so that's an example that I think is instructive, but there are many, many other economics levers that stand on that fulcrum of, of entrepreneurship, um, the ones Olivia talked about and, and Richard as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.